And with that, let's get started. So I'm gonna start by introducing our host, Hannah Sung. Hannah Sung is a journalist and podcast producer with Media Girlfriends. And previously she worked at the Globe and Mail, TVO, Much Music, and she was the Asper Fellow in Journalism at the University of Western Ontario in 2020. Um, Hannah writes the newsletter at the end of the day and she tweets over at, at Hannah Sung. So over to you, Hannah. Thank you so much, Mo. And I wanna welcome everybody here today. Um, I'm here with the panelists, so I can only see them. I can't see uh, anybody else. I trust you're out there. Um, and I know that everybody's time is so precious. So I'm just so pleased that you are here to join us. Um, I only heard of Foodshare about a year ago. I was looking for a grocery delivery and a friend told me about Foodshare. I was really just looking for lettuce and tomatoes, et cetera. And then the more I learned about Foodshare, I was just in awe. I mean, I am so appreciative that my food can come from an organization where their ethos runs so deep. And the more I learn about them, the more I love them. So um, I had the wonderful pleasure of speaking with Paul Taylor, the CEO. Uh, I love all of his approaches to leadership. Um, I spoke with him for a podcast that I host called What Do We Do Tomorrow? Um, so yeah, I know that everybody who has come to this session today probably uh, approaches Foodshare from a different place and has a different uh, story of how they first heard about Foodshare but I'm so glad that you're all here. Uh, we are talking about food justice today, of course, and I have some wonderful panelists here with me. Um, I wanna say voila or something like that, and you can all turn on your cameras. Uh, I'm still not quite sure what it looks like for everybody watching at home, um, but I think probably you should be able to see our wonderful panelists now. Um, I'd like to introduce them as we get started. They're each involved in community-led initiatives to advance food justice in different ways. Uh, Tara Ramkalawan is the volunteer coordinator of the Waterfront uh, Good Food Market, a resident-run nonprofit market at Bathurst and Lakeshore. She also supports groups across the whole city to run their own good food markets in all types of settings, including schools, churches, and seniors' residences. Welcome, Tara. We also have Jennifer Scott. She is an organizer with Foodsters United and the Foodsters United Co-op and has played a key role in their success at unionizing. When Foodora left Canada in May, 2020, her time has been spent working to support couriers and determine the future of Foodsters United. Jennifer believes strongly that preparing and eating food is a gift of care and maintains a monthly ritual where she cooks a three course meal for herself, which I love. I love that tidbit about yourself. <laughs> Welcome, Jennifer. Maria Londonio Ferrero is a Colombian born immigrant and settler to Canada who is currently living on the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee in Toronto. She is the market coordinator of the Scarborough Co op market. Welcome, Maria. So, I just wanted to let everybody who is here today know that you can contribute questions uh, for the panelists by using the Q&A function. So you can chat amongst yourselves. You can also use the Q&A function to actually ask questions. If you don't have a question yourself, you can still get involved in the Q&A by voting up or down uh, some of the questions that have been put in there. So keep those questions coming. Um, so we're going to first turn our attention to Tara and find out all about your work. Uh, let's see, are you unmuted? Yes, we are good to go. Hi, everyone. Um, hi. Nice to be here. Yeah, it's really nice to meet you today. Um, I learned that your waterfront good food market is in a Toronto community housing apartment building, and it's been run for 11 years by volunteers. Um, can you tell us how you got started with your own market first before we start talking about the other ones across the city? Yeah, so at first I would have to tell you a little bit about my area, the area that I live in at Bathurst and Lakeshore. Um, so I've been living here for about 20 years and when I first moved here, um, it was about four blocks of apartment buildings, um, some Toronto housing, an artist co-op, some other co-ops, um, some lower income housing, some subsidized housing. Um, and other than that, there were no condos on our part of the lakeshore for blocks. Um, so in this area of Toronto, 
Um, there were not a lot of services. It was hard to find a doctor, much less a grocery store. Um, and people were traveling outside of the area in order to shop. Um, there was maybe a Rava, you know, which is a little uh, pricier, um, you know, a, a little way. Uh, you could take the bus maybe, or if you wanted a long walk, you could go. Um, but there was that need for um, more accessible, affordable food right in our area. Um, and if you're familiar with the Bathurst and Lakeshore area of Toronto, um, and if you've been here recently, you'll know that there has been just an explosion of condos everywhere. Um, so with those condos have come a lot of services. Um, so now we have dentists and doctors, um, and we also have grocery stores, but they're all higher priced grocery stores. And a lot of those original buildings in these four blocks or so um, still have to travel out of the area to um, access affordable groceries. Um, so about 11 years ago, we started, um, a bunch of us residents just got together to start the Waterfront Good Food Market. Um, and uh, it's been resident run, volunteer run, um, and it's a weekly market um, that makes fresh produce more accessible in our neighborhood. Um, and for the past five years, uh, kind of building on what I've done in my neighborhood, I started working at FoodShare, um, where I get to work with um, agencies, resident groups across Toronto um, to support that kind of work in their own neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And so can you tell us a little bit, either from your own market or the other ones that you help support, can you tell us a little bit about the mechanics of how the community is involved in the market? Like, it's wonderful that it's volunteer run, but there must be money that's exchanged. You know, how do these markets run sustainably? Um, so if you want to kind of get some visuals, I think everyone would have received with their, um, in their email today, an invite to this, uh, this event. And there's a link to the Harmony Good Food Markets uh, video, um, which our comm team at FoodShare put together. And that kind of gives you some visuals of what a good food market looks like. Um, uh, so I would invite everybody to go back and take a look at that um, if they haven't already. Um, but in terms of how my, uh, my community is involved, um, you know, we, we're running the market, we're deciding what to order, what foods to make available, you know, uh, we're catering to the community. So, you know, what they want in terms of culturally appropriate produce, if they want, you know, okra, they want plantain, we can bring, um, you know, we make it our mandate to bring what they, what they need, right? Um, but alongside kind of running the logistics of a weekly produce market, we try to make sure that it's also a community building event and that we give opportunities to the community um, to participate in other ways. So we have residents who are coming as vendors. Um, we, uh, we partner with the local Waterfront Neighborhood Community Center um, in order to uh, help them do outreach for their programs. Um, so it becomes more of a, a community event. Um, there are a lot of, uh, there's a large Caribbean population in this neighborhood too. So, you know, every, every good food market in the city looks different. And at ours, you know, you might find things like, you know, cold sorrel drinks in the summer, um, moringa seeds that you could plant, um, you know, samosas to buy, uh, artwork from local, local artists and things like that. When you talk about the community aspect, uh, I do not picture a big box grocery store. It feels like it's the opposite, you know? Um, and I wonder if you can just tell us a little bit about your experience, um, it, whether it's yourself or your community over the course of that 11 years, you know, what changes have you seen? Well, I mean, I, I can definitely talk about, you know, COVID and, and how, you know, running a market during COVID has been, um, you know, it's been a challenge in terms of, you know, activities and kind of that gathering being dampened. But at the same time, um, you know, we've, we've had to kind of advocate to stay open, you know, to, to be recognized as an essential service and not just, you know, an event, right, where people gather, like this is an essential service um, that makes food accessible in our neighborhood. Um, we've, you know, we previously would do some deliveries to, to neighbors. And during COVID, um, you know, we've seen the need for deliveries to seniors who, who can't or don't want to come out due to the risk 
um, during COVID. And this is all volunteer run. So, you know, having to find volunteers, you know, we've, we've kind of just worked from week to week. We've put calls out to just like our whole customer base for whoever um, is coming to the market. Would you be willing to drop, um, you know, uh, an order back to someone in your building? And people have stepped up. So it's, it's very much um, a community, you know, we're working with whatever assets we have in the community as neighbors um, in order to keep this going. Um, and I feel like good food markets are uniquely positioned in order to serve those kinds of needs. So where a grocery store um, kind of serves a whole area as a good food market in our neighborhood, we can recognize those people who are struggling to get food and work with our partners, such as the community center or even just our neighbors to figure out how to solve those things. So is that, um... Is that one of the kind of priorities for you when you think about a good food market? Because you're helping to support so many of them across the city as well. Uh, is it about those relationships? Um, I mean, it's not really either or, it's about the relationships and the access to food. But you know, can you tell me a little bit more how they're integrated? It's, it's definitely about both. So it's definitely about the relationships. And I think within, um, you know, where we see good food markets happening, um, we see that there is an impact on social isolation on, and on um, community building. And frequently in um, lower income communities, there can be um, more, more uh, social isolation. There can be more issues. Um, you know, one type of market that we've um, supported our partners in doing at FoodShare, as well as we've run ourselves, is um, good food markets within uh, Toronto Community Housing and Seniors Buildings, for example. Um, and in those buildings, we see social isolation as a huge um, issue. Um, they're always asking, are you, you know, are you guys coming? Are you still coming? Like they're lined up waiting for the market to open before the time has even come. Um, and as well, there's, you know, such great food access issues there um, due to income due to um, physical mobility issues, due to medical issues. Um, and we see the consistent use of the program at those kinds of sites. But, you know, as someone looking from the outside, just a resident in Toronto, whether you're looking at my area or you're looking at a seniors building in Toronto community housing, that maybe they just have to take a bus to go, I don't know, a kilometer to, to the grocery store. You may not recognize that as an access issue, right? So you may not realize all of the barriers that people have there um, to getting the food. Mm -hmm. And so what kind of long-term long -term changes would you like to see um, through your work with the good food markets? Um, so through the good food markets, um, improvement of access, uh, you know, that can be, you know, I, I, I don't think markets will address everything. I think there's, uh, you know, it's a larger approach um, because access isn't just about physical access, it's about financial access as well. Um, so there's, there's both those pieces. Um, but I think, you know, as I think what, what I would like to see with markets is that we start to look at them um, not just as, um, you know, charitable models um, that we start to assess as a city um, where these areas of um, barriers to access are and start like legislating um, solutions for that rather than just having charitable models because there's only so much, you know, one organization like FoodShare or even all of the organizations working on food across Toronto can do to address um, these food access issues. We can do it in limited areas and amounts uh, and it needs to be sort of a broader approach. Mm -hmm. And going from that idea of the interconnectedness and the broader approach right down to the individual now, um, I bet there are people listening who are thinking, you know, if I wanted, if I see a problem with access to food in my own neighborhood, you know, what is something that I can do about that? Right, um, so for sure, uh, if you're in Toronto, um, and you'd like to connect with us at Food Share um, if, if you think that there's a need for a good food market in your neighborhood. Um, 
uh, maybe Mo can paste the link in the chat there for our Good Food Market Program page so you can find out a little bit more um, about the Good Food Market Program and how you can contact us. Um, uh, but I, I think it's, it's a whole lot of smaller, um, smaller efforts that do contribute to the bigger change that we're seeing. So, you know, I've been involved in other programs as well, community gardens. I'm in awe of what our community food growing team at FoodShare um, is doing in terms of, you know, using uh, green spaces um, at schools to have school farms. Um, in order to improve not just access to food, but the quality of the food that they're that they're putting out. So I think it's all of these programs together, all of these initiatives together, um, that will really improve the food system. And you know, it may seem like one one initiative, um, you know, is not going to change a whole system. But I think um, you know, together and with those conversations on the broader change that we need to see, um, that that a change can be made. Mm -hmm. I love learning about all of your work, Tara. I just think, you know, it's very inspiring to think about market by market, the, the changes that are being created because of the approach to the work. Um, so thank you so much. And don't go anywhere because we're still going to have like a Q&A towards the end with all of our panelists. Um, but thank you, Tara. We're going to move on now to Maria, Maria Londonio Ferrero, who was warning us today that she's never successfully completed a full Zoom. <laughs> so we're gonna do our best. And if we have some technical issues, we will survive. We're just gonna cross our fingers that we don't. Hi, Maria. Hi. <laughs> um, I wanted to add a little bit so that everybody here today knows a little bit more about Maria. So she runs the Scarborough Co-op Market. Um, she's also the project manager and a lead organizer of Food Knows No Borders, a food box delivery program, which provided 1,500 grocery deliveries to undocumented migrants, queer, trans, two-spirit individuals and families, and Indigenous people all over the GTA. Um, but first, we're going to start with a question about the Scarborough Co-op Market, okay? Uh, it's one of the newer markets you launched during the pandemic. I'm looking at Maria, and I'm afraid, are you frozen? I Okay. There. You, <laughs> there you are. You know, as soon there. as you said that I would have issues, I froze, so... <laughs> We'll give it a couple more tries, and if not, we'll have to do these cameras off. <laughs> yeah, we're going to do our best. Um, I want to know what prompted you to start the Scarborough Co-op Market. Absolutely. So I'm actually not one of the people who started it. It was started by two wonderful women, Chelsea Braun and Johanna Mahari of, uh, of Climate Justice Scarborough. Chelsea had this great idea. She saw funding being offered from Community Food Centers Canada, another amazing organization that we have in the city and in our country to offer the start of markets like this. And she applied, she had a great relationship with a community center in Scarborough, the West Scarborough Neighborhood Community Center, who also saw there was a need for more food security program in the area. Our air section of Scarborough, Southwest Scarborough is a food desert. And if you drive around, if you ever come and visit us, you'll see that it is very hard to find grocery stores. Very similar to Tara's experience, what she's seeing in her community, it's just not accessible and many of the grocery stores are spaced apart or they're not financially feasible for a lot of people in our community. So she actually applied before the COVID pandemic happened and her funding came through right as everything started shutting down. In some ways, this pushed the market to new heights. We had to reconsider accessibility, how we would make this market open and feasible for people who did not want to venture out of their homes, who could not, for folks who are staying at home and following all of the safety protocols. And that pushed us to offer curbside delivery, curbside pickup and delivery for folks in Scarborough. So now we're operating, uh, we open one day a week and it started by seeing that there was the need for this. I've lived in Scarborough my entire time in Canada and I always felt that too, that this community is huge. <laughs> Scarborough is massive. And maybe that's why it's hard to find community-based programming like this. So why not start it yourself? And now I'm so lucky to be in the position that I'm in. I'm so happy to come to the market each week and to be showcasing new vendors, new folks in our community and involving the community every step of the way. I love it. And I also, I grew up in Scarborough, so I know oh. and love Scarborough very well. Uh, it's not a walkable place. 
And when I was growing up as a kid, all I had was time. So I spent all my time on the TTC, right? There isn't really good um, TTC access as we know from all of the kind of uh, the political wrangling around subways, et cetera. Yeah. But of course, if you're an adult or if you're just trying to like make your way in the pandemic in life today, like time is so of the essence, people don't have all time to spend on the bus. And then uh, on top of that with COVID, it can be difficult to get around. I want to talk a little bit about the sustainability of your market uh, of, of what has been launched versus what you see as unsustainability about the more dominant model of the way that we get groceries. Absolutely. So let's start by talking about how the system is unsustainable as a whole. Our food system and our models of food production are massively extractive. They extract from our lands. If you look at any of our processes for mass scale, massive scale agriculture, they're consistently taking away land and we're moving towards food that is less nutritionally dense because of these models and these practices that our agricultural systems have um, partaken in for so long. So this, this looks like decreased soil health, this looks like decreased health of our animals and our livestock, and it's that in itself is not sustainable. Everyone's heard that stat, that you need something like seven planets to keep up with what North America needs to survive, and we don't have that. It's also extractive of our global communities this food system is built on the backs of migrant farm workers, many who are black or racialized folks. And we're so disconnected from that that we don't even think about the physical labor that it took to get the food on our plates. This is something that's happening in Ontario. We have migrant farm workers who bring this food on our plate. And we saw how catastrophic that was during COVID where folks were, folks' health was put on the line. There was no protection for them. They, even without COVID, they don't get the protections that any other regular resident of this country has, but we don't think about it. That's just how we get our food and that's that, that hook is over there. And that's not what we want. That's something that the Scarborough Co-op Market wants to work on as well, to let people know what had to go into their food for it to get on their plate and what we can fix that. It's also unsustainable because people are so disconnected from their food and this food is getting progressively more unhealthy that it's contributing to these rising rates of dietary related illnesses and marginalized and racialized groups in the city. It's not a complicated equation to find why there's higher rates of high cholesterol, diabetes, high blood pressure in many of these low income communities when the food that they have access to is highly processed or fast food, especially in the context that we're living in now with increased job losses and just in general living in a city as expensive as Toronto many many people have to choose between paying rent and the food and getting food on their plates and if you have to choose between paying a little bit more for some apples some kale whatever it may be and highly processed food then of course you're going to pick it and there's no shame in that but the shame is, is that we're not giving people the option to access food access good and nutritious food for a price that they can afford and that's what we want to do with the market through the support of Food Share and through the support of our major funder, Community Food Centers Canada, we're able to offer food at cost. It's a very similar experience from what Tara mentioned at her own market, where we try to represent, we try to bring in food that's representative of our community. Scarborough is very diverse in terms of people's backgrounds, people's incomes, people's dietary needs, and we're open to those discussions to offering uh, food that's representative of them. And that's what's going to make this market sustainable, buy-in from our community members, making it an accessible place for all community members to join in whatever way that looks like. We have vendor opportunities, we have volunteer opportunities. You can just email me and say, I would like to see oranges at the next community market day. And that's it, but it's, it's making it accessible and it's also making it a part of people's routine. So that's, that's the hope for our market and that is what will hopefully sustain us uh, for years to come. Mm -hmm. And I love that you bring up, um, you brought up shame at one point. Um, and it's, it's, it's really not about, it shouldn't be about individuals feeling shame. It's really about systems that are invisibilized on purpose because um, absolutely profits are driven when we ignore the ways in which um, food gets to our table. Um, and I wonder, you know, Yes, you bring up COVID and migrant farm workers. We've seen truly just terrible things um, locally um, in terms of just uh, uh, labor practices and a lack of rights for 
migrant workers. Um, can you tell us a little bit about whether your food market is able to sidestep um, the, the supply chain of food that, you know, comes to our mainstream grocery stores or in what ways you can kind of bring your ethos to your Scarborough co-op market? Absolutely. So along with how broken this food system is, it's, we live in Canada in a climate that's very hard. It's, we can't maintain a full year growing season. So most of our growing happens through the spring, summer, a little bit through the fall. So during those seasons, our market can capitalize on that. We can involve local growers, Sundance Harvest and Cheyenne Sundance, there's an amazing example of that. So many other local farmers who produce their food on these lands following organic growing practices and ethical growing practices. But throughout the rest of the year, it's extremely difficult. And even without the rest of the year, we don't grow bananas in Toronto. We don't grow oranges in Canada, but we want those at our market and people want those on their plates. So food share is an amazing resource for that. They get sourced their food as best as they can and, and often from local producers or through the food terminal itself. But I think there's no, there's no quick fix to that. Like I said, so many things that people need don't grow here. But at the very least, we can educate people and so that they know how their bananas are produced. They know how avocados are produced and maybe why maybe there's a reason why I don't want to sell avocados at the market or why I'm hesitant to bring in um, foods that, that are made through exploitation of farm workers. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean no. to cut you off. But it's, <laughs> no. it's just interesting. And the same theme comes up as what we were talking about with Tara at her market. It's that social interaction. Mm -hmm. We were talking about the sharing of education. Um, I know that you feel very strongly about centering communities uh, when it yeah. comes to changing the food system. Um, can you tell us about why communities need to be at the center of it? It's simple. It's because it's their food. One of the reasons why I'm so passionate about food justice work in general is because I can't think of anything else that is as consistent as needing to eat, along with needing a shelter, and both of those things work together. Uh, so it's something that you interact with at least once a day, maybe three, maybe five, whatever your dietary needs are, and people need to know where their food is coming from. Along with that, so many communities in our country, in our region, have been disenfranchised through food growing practices. Lands have been stolen from so many Indigenous communities from so many black growers. And there's that lack of connection to the land itself, which is so important to knowing where your food is coming from. Um, and there's so many ways to change that. There's incredible innovative programs that are allowing people to grow their own food, whether that's through a community garden or on their balconies or through allotment gardens, whatever it may be. But communities know what they need and they're the experts of their own lives. I, as the market coordinator at Scarborough Co-op, I'm just the one who, can connect folks to resources and make these things come to life. But I can't do any of that if I don't know what the community needs for me. And they're the ones that are gonna keep the market going. So they're the ones who are ultimately, my bosses in deciding all of this. And bosses in a very homey way, if we can say, because we're all working towards together. We're all working towards together a common goal of, of regaining control of our food, um, starting from a very simple way to maybe overturning all of this one day, but we'll start small and work from there. I'm just curious what the most popular items are at your market. So recently things have changed a bit. We've introduced some amazing food vendors, Spent Goods, and another amazing local producer, Monster Bread. She is a small baking co-op who's just started out and those things have been flying off the shelf. So locally produced breads, locally produced sweet treats like Monster Breads makes, those things are massively popular. In terms of produce, um, Kale is always a big one, which is really great. Oranges are also an amazing one for the kids. So our market operates out of West Scarborough Neighborhood Community Center, like I said, and they have a lot of programming for children. So the kids often guide their parents on what to get. So we'll hide the cookies and make sure that they can get their apples and oranges <laughs> and bananas instead. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And uh, just keeping on the tip of the community level action, um, I wanna ask you a little bit about caremongering or mutual aid. What are you seeing these days? So I think that's a big theme that has grown out of COVID. Caremongering, if people haven't heard that term before, it was created by a woman in Toronto actually to try to counter the scaremongering that was happening with COVID at the very beginning of the pandemic and to create groups 
on Facebook, on social media, within your communities that respond directly to community needs. And it can be so simple. If you go on Facebook, you can look up groups and they probably exist in your own community, but it can be as simple as saying, I bought an extra bag of masks. I'll leave them on my porch. If anyone needs to come and get them, they'll be there. Or in the other way around, I really need $25 to make my grocery bill this week. Can anyone help me out? And it'll happen. And those are such simple ways to include community and being a part of your community, supporting your community members in your everyday life, or they can grow a little bit bigger into mutual aid projects. The ones that I love to highlight are the People's Pantry Toronto and the community fridges that have popped up all around Toronto. Also such simple ideas. What is simpler than setting up a fridge that people can fill and people can take from as they need, but it's something that we didn't need. But as soon as you put these things in the community, you see how dramatically they impact their community and how drastically they're needed. I was also involved in a food box delivery project called Food Knows No Borders. We just finished up and we serviced undocumented folks, queer, trans and two-spirit folks and indigenous families all over the city. We were designed to just bring groceries to folks who didn't have the needs to get them. And we were massively successful because these things are needed. We were able to deliver 1500 groceries um, in the span of five or six months. So every week we delivered to about 100 families. And it was different from a traditional, let's say Loblaws delivery or uh, other mainstream grocery models because we communicated directly with the people who needed them. So delivered one week and they would email us back. Oh, I didn't need this. I don't use rutabaga or I don't use carrots. That's fine. We'll make you a bag of things that you can use so we can counter food waste as well. Or the quality of the tomatoes weren't great this week. We're sorry about that and we'll do better next week. But you can see that these things are needed. And when you make these opportunities available to folks, not only are their needs met, but they feel like they're being met in a dignified way. It's so hard to ask for help. But if you make the space for it to be, for these conversations to happen, for help to be given, then, uh, then people feel fulfilled and people feel like they're a part of this and, and they're not just getting handouts or replicating a charity model. Mm -hmm. I love it. All amazing points. And, you know, when you say the community knows best what they need, it's so true. I've been keeping tabs on a community fridge in my own area. And I saw on Instagram that there was some pushback from the city. I think I'm not quite sure, but maybe the fridge was in the way on the sidewalk or something like that. It all got resolved. I was happy to see that because I see those fridges do get so much action, so exactly. much going in, so much coming out. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Maria. And thank of you, course, Hannah. you should stick around as well um, for our Q&A at the end. Um, and your Zoom worked the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> yes. One Amazing. more thing I'll say, just to end on, yeah. a, on a piece of hope, if any of our participants out there have any ideas, anything that they see that are missing from their community, try it out, start, get connected to an organization or just start with a group of people because there's momentum out there, there's funds out there to make these things happen. And that's the only way that our city is gonna represent what we all want it to look like. I love that. And you know, uh, there's a friend that I have who is, a, is an organizer. And when the pandemic was happening, I said to him, how can people get things started in their own community? And he said to me something that really stuck with me, which is if you see a need, probably somebody else also has already seen that need. They've probably already started something, search out who's already doing that work. And it's true, there's, there's always people who are already out there doing the work. But if you spot a problem where you're the first person to spot it, then, then go for it. You'll find like-minded people to work with. Exactly. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks. We're moving along to Jennifer Scott now. I have so many questions for you. Let's see if we can cram them all in. Okay. Uh, you are a bike courier and that's how you became involved with uh, Foodsters United. Um, you're very independent too, I've learned, and you like to make your own clothing and household items. So that I find very interesting as well. Uh, but first, I'd love for you to tell us um, in a nutshell, what is Foodsters United? What is the story there? For sure. So Foodsters United was um, a very large group of bike couriers and car couriers and e-bike couriers who all worked for Foodora, who wanted better working conditions. Um, and so we rallied together, organized together, and we filed a bid to unionize our workplace. And so this is precedent setting in Canada. Uh, at that time, there had not been any gig workers who had tried to file a unionization bid. And um, 
as is the case with gig workers in almost all countries in the world, we are misclassified as independent contractors, where we are dependent contractors or employees, depending on local legislation. Um, and an independent contractor is not entitled to the right to unionize and, of course, has absolutely zero labor protections. Um, and so we went to the labor board and um, we won the case uh, for being dependent contractors. And so that means that the labor board looked at the working conditions of gig workers at Foodora and decided that no, we were not independent contractors. And we were in fact, folks who are entitled to labor protections, workers' rights, and the right to unionize. And uh, we were able to, partly due to the pandemic, uh, get our ballot box open. So like when you try to unionize, all the workers have to vote like yes or no to having a union, right? Um, and we got ours open fairly quickly. Um, and so 89.6% of workers, like Fudora workers voted yes for a union, which uh, is an impossible feat. On average, it's usually a number closer to 60 or 70% of workers that vote yes. Um, and so then uh, throughout the pandemic, uh, Fudora declared bankruptcy uh, and left Canada, um, which left a lot of folks without work. Um, and so we rebuilt and we rebuilt by starting a worker owned co-op. So I, I love the story. Congratulations, by the way, on your huge win uh, with organizing a union. And I heard a podcast about uh, Fudora and the bid to unionize um, among workers. Um, it was made by the Toronto Star and the Atkinson Foundation. Did you also hear that, Jennifer? Maybe you were in it. I, I, don't know. I am in it. I'm you in are it. in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, it's I, a great one. If you haven't listened to it, please oh, do. Uh, Sarah so from the good. Toronto Star. Uh, I let it. It's fantastic. Yeah, and I mentioned it for everybody who's here today in case you want to know more about the issues. Um, it's a great explainer on everything that was happening. Um, so that leads us to your part of the story where you get to Foodsters United Co-op. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us now about your work there? For sure. So um, when Foodora left Canada, um, there were tons of folks like me who work for multiple apps. I, at the time I worked for Fedora and Uber Eats and Skip the Dishes and DoorDash and Corner Shop and lots of- At the same time. That. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, I mean, it gives wow. you some job security, some job protection, right? Um, but there are also lots of us who don't have that luxury. Uh, you know, you can be deactivated at any moment without any recourse. And so through no fault of your own, uh, you can lose access to apps. Um, there are barriers to work on different apps. And so you may not be able to provide documentation to access some of them, which was the case uh, specifically with Fedora. A lot of folks were able to work on Fedora who were not able to access any of the other apps. Fedora had slightly different uh, documentation standards. And so when they declared bankruptcy and left, we had a large group of people who could not yet on another app, who in a pandemic did not qualify for CERB and had no jobs. Um, and to some degree, like when with labor organizing, I think a lot of what we do is we look for voids in people's lives and we try to fill them a little bit. Um, it's, it's, that's, that's the community of what you can offer each other, right? And so seeing Fedora leave, obviously that's very traumatic. And then seeing this void be created, these folks who relied on Fedora and who now lost their work at Fedora and, and all work. Um, we were like, shit, what do we do? And somebody said, what if we start, started a co-op? And none of us knew what that was, really. Uh, I remember for the first month, it was largely just like researching, like, what is a co-op? There's six different kinds of co-ops. How do they work, you know? Um, but we pushed through it and we settled on a worker-owned co-op, which means that uh, everybody who earns income from the co-op, whether it's investment or um, like wages, uh, is a worker in the co-op. They have a voting say on how the co-op functions. They have a vote on how much money we make, on how we make decisions, on what uh, business relationships we have or how we treat our customers. They are an owner in a business. And so for gig workers, people who have access to 
very little, it feels like a lot of the time, um, and very little control over our, our work and how it impacts our lives. This idea um, that we could own our own and start our own business. And on top of that, a business that would fight the gig economy by doing something similar to what apps like Uber and Instacart do, but doing it better and doing it ethically and doing it in a way that's worker driven and um, sustainable. And you know, all of these sort of like key things that we all know the gig economy is in, right? And so does Foodsters United Co-op also do food delivery? So uh, unfortunately, unlike Uber Eats, uh, we don't have uh, significant um, investment money <laughs> to have started up with a really snazzy, really cool app and a business. So what we are doing uh, is building a business that we can build. And so we're starting with contract deliveries in our first stage, and we're looking at building our business over a three to five year period of time and going like building up to uh, bigger on demand uh, business that can challenge uh, the gig economy and solve the logistics problems that exist for workers in that industry. So for today, we take small contract local jobs um, with uh, the next step being moving on to something that's actually a little bit more similar to what Instacart and Corner Shop do, uh, which would be like personal uh, shopping and delivery, grocery, pharmacy, um, items like that. And is there a way that we can support our community by finding um, potentially grants or partnership opportunities to subsidize uh, that service? Because uh, we've recognized that this is a service that's important to people but often inaccessible due to the cost uh, for people who need it, like people who are homebound, right? I love what you're working on, especially because, uh, you know, the whole theme of today's talk is self-determined solutions. And I really can't think of, um, you know, a more apt example of self-determination than kind of rising from the ashes, re-evaluating uh, how to put the worker at the center and then trying to, um, do that work, but people first. And um, I just love that. And I wonder, I don't want to be too abroad and thinky about it, but I wonder if we can talk about self-determination from a gig economy perspective, because the gig economy is just this thing that just keeps growing. It, it doesn't really seem like getting a permanent full-time job with benefits, et cetera, doesn't really seem like that is accessible to so many. Um, so yeah, just some general thoughts on the gig economy would be great. <laughs> so I mean, the first thing that I would say, and you know, I mean, I don't mean to fear monger, but I do mean to make you feel uncomfortable. I think the gig economy is coming for your jobs. Um, I don't think it's about food delivery. Uh, I don't think it's about shopping and Instacart. I think it's about changing the relationship between people and work. And as app-based employers make wins with us, they will be able to make it easier to change the way that you work in your industry. Um, and so challenging and fighting the gig economy is really something that is gonna take a community. It's gonna take all of us. And that's sort of like, like app employers, I think they really underestimated people and really underestimate our ability to organize because as gig workers we are so separated from each other it, it on the surface seems so impossible that we could uh, rally 800 or a thousand food door workers in the city of Toronto when we have no shared workspace and no connection to each other that we could all rally together to do something as audacious as try to unionize um, but we can because community is what people want um, and so I think when we talk about fighting the gig economy, we need to sort of expand our definition of what community looks like in that context. And that community looks like everybody. You know, Toronto is our city and these are our streets. And so the future of how the gig economy impacts us is up to all of us. As gig workers who have been organizing, we have a little bit little bit of experience and we can help, but we're gonna need support from the broader community, from everybody in the community to win. And I think particularly when we talk about the co-op, like 
cooperative businesses historically are often successful because they have communities supporting them. Um, and, and so like, you know, we, we kind of, I guess I'm saying we have that need like twice. Um, we're challenging the gig economy and we need your help to do that. And we're trying to set up a co-op and we need your help to do that. But um, also existing during the pandemic makes me feel like that's actually just gonna be so easy. We all want that. We, we all want to see each other live better lives. We want to live better lives. We want to know our neighbors are living good lives. And we want to rally together and make that possible for each other. And I am hard pressed to imagine that the majority of folks in Toronto would not love to run Uber out of town and see restaurant owners and restaurant workers and delivery people earning good wages um, and being proud of the things that they do at work. I, I think you would have no problem getting everybody on this call to completely agree with the things you're saying. Uh, I think that there might be a gap in knowing how to support uh, the ideas that you're sharing. So um, if you think about uh, the average person who might be your age or my age in the city who um, might be ordering off their phone, all kinds of things, you know, what is it they can do if they feel that they want to, they would rather be supporting uh, the types of work that you're doing? What are the nuts and bolts of how they could support Foodsters United Co-op, for example? For sure. Um, I love connecting people with information and uh, like, like ways to reach out to others. And I love uh, sort of like going through the nuances of how to do that in a way that's interesting for you. So if you like labor theory, if that's, if it's the organizing aspect that's interesting for you, connect with gig workers who are organizing. Uh, Foodsters United uh, no longer stands as a union. However, later this week on Thursday, uh, it's gonna be relaunching as Gig Workers United. So maybe uh, watch out for This them. Thursday meaning 48 hours? Yeah. <laughs> wow, yeah. wow um, that's amazing. Yeah, so Gig Workers United will be a community union, uh, which I don't think we've had in Toronto for a long time, uh, in a labor partnership with CUPW. Um, and that would be a great place, a great resource for you to go to get that sort of like high level labor based information about the gig economy. Um, in fact, if you want to drop by, Gig Workers United's launch uh, is at Spadina and Bloor from 11 till 2 and five till nine on Thursday, and you can say hello. Um, but if you're more interested in practical day-to-day, -day, then I would say the co-op is the place for you. Um, our our co-op, uh, like the, like the steering committee, like the folks who are, are leading the bulk of the work is a really interesting group of people. We have like the bulk of folks are gig workers, right? And we've got gig workers who can earn a lot of income and gig workers who income is, is very low. And then we have a lot of gig workers who are struggling so much that they can't even really help build the, the co-op and um, they're just kind of around when they can be because that's the nature of this work, right? And then we also have folks from like our external community, like what I was talking about earlier. We have uh, tech workers, we have students, um, we have artists. And I guess what I'm getting at is that the to, to do this work, if you're more interested in the practical aspect, there is space for you to actually come and do the work, like build the co-op, help us. Uh, if you have a small business, if you're a retail or a restaurant partner, let's let's chat about working together um if you want to know how to support a startup co-op and how to be part of of sort of launching it and watching it grow and contributing to its growth um help fund the startup donate to food share watch what we do patronage our business um and if you want to like really get in the grit with us and build the co-op and learn about the gig economy that way send us an email like we could use you uh, like I said it's it's gonna take all of us it's gonna take a broad and big community to succeed at this um, but I think folks want that and I think we've got the resources I agree with you that I think folks want that um, thank you so much Jennifer for telling us all about how you went from Foodsters United to Gig Workers United. It's, it's a fascinating story and congrats on your big, you know, 
launched this week. Um, we are coming towards ooh, the end of our hour and we have uh, one question in the Q&A that's been submitted. I haven't been able to keep up on the chat while we've been having the conversation. So if you do have a question, please drop it into the Q&A, which is a little button at the bottom of your screen. Um, so I will start with a question from Effie. Um, who writes, can you talk a little bit more about how the community is part of the decision-making of the market? How do you stay reflective of and responsive to the community? Is there a steering group that people can join and inform and or other input processes people can contribute to? So I think this is a question for both Maria and Tara. Who'd like to start? Um, I, I can start um, in terms of talking about markets across Toronto. Um, so. Uh, each, each market uh, is very unique and individual. Um, so at, on our Good Food Market program page, um, I think which was posted earlier, um, there's, but Mo, Mo could paste it again in the chat, there's a map at the bottom um, that shows Good Food Markets across Toronto and has the contact information for markets across Toronto. So, you know, a market in a Toronto Housing Seniors building that serves the seniors there might look very different and might be run very different from a market that's run um, at George Brown College on their campus um, to serve the students, right? Um, so it's, it's about just getting involved, get, contacting the coordinator and seeing how that particular market is running, what their format is. Maria? Yeah, I guess I'll speak more directly to Scarborough Co-op and very similar things to what Jennifer was just saying about starting a co-op. Um, so although our name is Scarborough Co-op Market, we are not yet operating as a co-op. Since we started so recently, my job right now is to just get a strong foundation so that we can mobilize into a co-op. So people can buy memberships or you can volunteer and you'll get a membership that way as well. And really it's as simple as sending me an email or coming to a market day telling me what you want to see and I'll do my best to make it happen. Um, and then hopefully when we have the capacity to operate fully as a co-op, then we can have a steering committee or a board of directors or whatever that sort of structure takes place. Um, but that also requires the market to be financially sustainable so that it can it can fully function and hire people along with it. Wonderful. And uh, I'm just checking in our Q and A. Um, I don't actually see any more questions. So really, oh, somebody just snuck in <laughs> under the gun here. Charlotte um, is asking. And I believe this will be probably our last question. Um, you can try and sneak another one in there uh, if you have a burning question. Charlotte asks, if a wave of social action for social justice in food comes along as they have in recent years of waves of support for different social justice causes, how would you sustain that support? Um, maybe I'll go to Jennifer with that. So, uh... I have an answer. I often give this at the union, um, but it's it's super boring. Um, my answer is that uh, we sustain necessary support and necessary interest by building infrastructure that is sustainable. So um, folks are interested, folks want to participate. How do we rally that energy, that enthusiasm, that ability to do work? And how do we do that in a way that is long-term consistent and sustainable? How do we build together infrastructure that means that it's not just a wave and it is, uh, I don't know, becomes the norm. Um, and I think the tools for doing that are really just communication, um, active engagement, inviting people to participate, helping people learn, providing education, um, and building people up so that their interest turns into skills and their skills turn into resources. And then they, they then become someone who helps to maintain and build that infrastructure. It's, um, I just can only see it in that very practical day-to-day uh, -day sort of application. I love it. And you know, I'm going to, uh, bring this to a close by asking everyone, I'm stealing this from a different Zoom I was in once that I thought was fantastic. And the moderator said, everybody drop in just one word in the chat, but how they feel leaving this um, Zoom conversation. Uh, I know that I feel very energized by all of the work that you're doing and learning about it. Um, 
So I'm gonna kick that off there. And while that chat is going off, I'm just gonna close with a comment from Paul Taylor, who is the CEO of Foodshare. Um, and he says, this is more of a comment than a question. I just wanted to say thank you for all the work that you do and for sharing it with us today. It was inspiring to listen to the work that you do alongside various communities and the passion that you bring to it. Um, that is the perfect note to end on. I echo those sentiments and I think um, it's safe to say that everybody here who is listening probably does too. Jennifer, Tara, Maria, thank you so much. And thank you to Foodshare, obviously, uh, for organizing for all the work that you do. Thank you to everybody who's participating. Keep the chat going, if you like, with all the nice, happy words and uh, have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you so much. <laughs>